Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, so it's it's time to start. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Gerald Tuft. So before going, so let me introduce about Professor Gerald Tuft um, quite briefly. So he was born in 1946. And interestingly, he has two daughters and five grandchildren, according to here, his CV. And also, you can find, if you Google and Tuft, you can find his Wikipedia page. Then, so as you can see, so I will not share this screen because already Professor Tuft's screen was shared. So, his main contribution is threefold. One is gauge theories in elementary particle physics. So as you, all of you know, and renormalizability and in yang mill theory. And so as a result of his work, I mean, he got, he became a Nobel laureate in oh, 1999. So with his advisor, Professor Feldman. So he, he also contributed to his large and expansion and also instanton calculation, so to, to Polyakov monopole. And simply, you know, you may be familiar with some two anomaly matching so in various areas. His another contribution is quantum gravity and black holes. So yeah, he's also a pioneer for the introduction of a holographic principle with Leonard Susskind. So I think today he will talk about fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics. So, so Tuft, according to this Wikipedia page, Tuft has deviating views on physical interpretation of quantum theory. Particularly in 2016, he published a book, Length Exposition of His Ideas, which according to Tuft has encountered some mixed reactions. What well, I don't know what it means. So, so yeah, I think. I mean, this this will will give us very I mean great opportunity. Basically, you can ask any questions during his talk. So yeah, so please uh, start, Professor Tuft. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and your introduction. I will speak slowly if, but if for whatever reason you don't understand or you want me to repeat something, just interfere and, and ask to, to me to do so. So uh, yes, this talk is on a way of looking at, at quantum mechanics, which for a long time was not popular. And I'm hoping to bring some change in that and explain to you how I think about quantum mechanics, which is indeed not exactly how normally people talk and think about it. So we are used to this classical theory, <clears throat> planets and stars, <coughs> billiard balls and so on. And we know exactly the effective laws of nature by which they move. And we call these laws of nature deterministic, which really means that there's only one truth and the truth is the, described by the coordinates of all the objects that you're talking about. And the way these, these coordinates evolve in time is given by very precise classical equations. However, on the atomic scale, this is no longer true it seems. So at the atomic scale, the only laws we can write down are quantum mechanical laws, and they seem to be not deterministic. So even if you know as well as you can ever think, dream of the initial states of all the atoms in a certain process, then you will not find that the laws that tell these how these atoms evolve will be referring only to the reality that you see, but there's something else going on. You could call it a hidden variable. And there's something 
not right with the deterministic viewpoint. So um, it so happens that it's, it is about for a hundred years now that physicists know what to do. And they call that the Copenhagen Convention or Copenhagen Interpretation. And the answer to the questions is, don't ask any question, just follow the rules, do the calculation. Here is the Schrodinger equation. And if you use that equation, you will find everything that you want to know. And there is not more to be found. That is, is in short, the Copenhagen viewpoint. And it made a lot of sense. So people who work with quantum mechanics could use that rule. They found that they could, under all circumstances, compute what they want to know. And the theory works as well as you can ever expect it to be. But when particles move, say, in beams towards each other and they collide, the collision is precisely described by quantum mechanical rules, but the theory never predicts you exactly in which direction people, the, the particles will scatter, but the particles will scatter randomly in all directions, in some directions more than other, but you can't say they'll go in any specific direction. So that is the situation today. And to some people, including myself, this is not quite the ideal situation. It is literally like the situation you have when you predict the weather. So um, when you predict the weather, you can say with certain probabilities what the weather will be tomorrow and the day after, even what the weather will be weeks or months after now, you can write down a probability distribution, but you cannot say exactly what the weather will be. However, in case of the weather, at least what you can say, we know which laws are responsible. They're just too difficult for us to solve because every single atom in, uh, in, in, the, in the clouds and every single cloud and, and every um, status of the weather at every point on the planet Earth must be given. And then in principle, you should be able to predict the weather much more precisely than you can now. And the more precise statements you can make about the initial state, the better the prediction becomes. But for atoms, this is not the case. So, um, and according in particular to uh, John Stuart Bell and many others, an aspect who actually did the experiment, they say, no, it doesn't work. You cannot predict the future from what you know now, no matter how accurately you describe, no matter what kind of data, it will not work. They give a so-called no-go theorem. Now, when I hear people write down a no-go theorem, I know that they're just missing something because it hasn't happened before again and again that someone writes that something is impossible. You can try it if you like, but this solution will not work. Then you know only one thing, which is that the method used wasn't right. They didn't think of something. And the same thing here, people who say, that there is no way to interpret quantum mechanics in terms of deterministic uh, processes, then they haven't taken into account everything. And my bottom line will be, and I'll say that precisely, if you have a deterministic theory, it must be deterministic uh, all the way. So everything must be deterministic. You should not allow for any chance to occur. As soon as you do that, the theory doesn't work anymore and everything becomes unpredictable. So that will be the bottom line. I say it now just to give you a sketch of what I'm going to talk about. And uh, there are clues that you can use to understand in which way direction to search for a better theory. And one clue is given, uh, oh, I, I should say, if you don't understand me well, I can imagine it's a long distance for the signals now to travel. If you don't understand me for whatever reason, please shout and I'll try to talk lower or clearer. So um, I would hope that is clear. So there is an interesting clue as to where to search for a better description of quantum mechanics in terms of 
deterministic laws. And that is by considering an unstable particle. In particle physics, but also in nuclear physics, there are many particles or states of particles or states of atoms which are unstable. The after a certain amount of time, the atom decays by emitting a particle or uh, a particle can decay by splitting in several other more stable particles. We call those unstable particles. And the unstable particles are known to obey an exponential decay law. The exponential law says that at all moments when you look at such a particle, the probability that it will decay right now stays the same. That probability can be very small, it can be very big. The particle can have an average lifetime of only nanoseconds or less, or the particle can have an average lifetime of billions of years or more, but they all share the same property. The exponential decay law is described by an exponential curve. How can you square that with determinism? Suppose that you have a, uh, a particle, but you imagine the particle to contain a clock. The clock is ticking and the clock ticks from, from 100 to zero, 100, 99, 98, 97, and so on. It goes all the way to zero. And when the clock says zero, the particle says bam, and it decays. That is not an exponential law, but that such laws are usually not found for decaying particles. So particles don't carry a clock, they decay spontaneously with a probability that remains the same. And the question you can then ask is, can you square this with determinism? And the answer is absolutely yes. By itself, such a decay would be a normal thing to expect in a deterministic theory. But you have to remember one thing, the state we call the vacuum state, which is a state with no particles presence at all. That state is not empty. There's lots of things going on. In fact, what we call vacuum looks more like white noise. Think of a television set that is not tuned in to any broadcasting station. So the television set just gives you a screen with uh, which is blinking in all states. That's uh, um, we call that vacuum fluctuations. And if you assume now that the vacuum state actually contains very, very many fluctuating data, which fluctuate essentially randomly, then you can say, okay, a particle feels those data only when the surrounding data or the data surrounding the particle take a very special value, the particle suddenly decays. And um, uh, that uh, it is ex exactly the way you can describe a decaying particle. And that picture works excellently qualitatively. But now the question is, okay, if you have this insight, then what is that law? What is the special state that the vacuum has to be in for this particular particle to decay and for other particles to decay? All different particle types decay at their own preferred rate. But the question is how do we fill in the details of such a theory? And question? Yes. Yeah, can it? So, so, so let, let me check out whether I understand the, the statement. So based on some chaos or some chaos mechanism, you will derive some H bar and some uncertainty principle will have some fundamental principle of quantum mechanics or some that. Yes. So what you say is exactly right. My aim is to derive such a law. Now I have to add immediately to get the details right is extremely difficult. And I have not even come close to doing that. So uh, I, I'm, if you think I'm, I'm a have a ready, a full prepared theory and you can switch it on right now to compute anything you like. No, I have not done that. But what I can do is explain how such a theory will work, how it should be set up. Okay, thank you. I hear some noises. I don't know what they come from. Okay. Um, 
So the prototype and the way to think about such a theory is called a cellular automaton. A cellular automaton is, you have to imagine a grid. This grid would fill up the entire universe. The sizes of the grid are extremely small, smaller than anything we have to be able to study in physics today. You can make a combination of the fundamental constants of nature, the speed of light, Planck's constant, and Newton's gravity constant to find a unit of length, which is extremely small, even compared to particles that we know. And um, it is probably that scale at which we have to think, about which we have to think to understand this cellular automaton. And um, what it basically is, is on the grid, at every side of the grid, there are certain data indicated here in this picture in terms of triangles, spheres, or other objects in this picture gave them different colors, just to indicate that every single lattice site can be in a certain state. I call that a state, but this time it is a completely classical state. Some people, had the same idea about the cellular automaton, but then they fill in quantum equations for the cellular automaton. I'm saying no, those won't eventually be quantum equations. They will be classical equations. Very important to remember, that is my statement, but I have not yet, or not at all, been able to specify the details of these states. It is probably very, very hard to do so. To do that right, you have to know a lot more about the standard model. The standard model, that describes the particles today as best as we can using Schrodinger equations, using quantum mechanics. But eventually I'm saying no, the correct equations should be without quantum mechanics. If you can write down such equations, you will be able to be in a state that you'll understand much more. And I claim there will be an important uh, outcome of, of this, this, these investigations, which is the statement that yes, in principle, we should be able to calculate the constants of nature in the standard model. Today, we know that the standard model contains more than 20 constants of nature. Those constants of nature have to be measured and put in by hand in the theory for the theory to work. We have no way of computing these constants. My claim is if we understand the problem I'm talking about, if we understand that right, then we can actually calculate those constants and we can have something to check the theory with experiments because those constants will be computable and we can compare them with what has been measured. That there will be 20 measuring points which will be able, which should allow us to check the theory. But I am not even close to that kind of stage in formulating this theory. Um, so my claim is now that every choice of cellular automaton, every choice for its evolution law will give me a quantum theory. One can compute uh, what will happen when particles collide, at least if you know exactly what to look at. But that is an extremely difficult question what to look at, but any theory described by any cellular automaton, a local cellular automaton, so the interactions should be interactions between neighbors only, then it will become a quantum field theory. And in principle, you should be able to compute all the kinds of particles that are there and how they interact. It works in two directions. I can also start with a theory such as a standard model and in principle derive what cellular automaton will generate this behavior. I add the words in principle. In practice, it is very difficult to do so, but at least I know what the questions are and all we have to do now is try to answer the questions. So with respect to this theory, we are very close to quantum field theory before the 1970s when we started to learn how to fill in the rules. So I don't know what the rules are. So let me begin with a prototype of a um, quantum model that explains to you how to think and how to work in, in such a theory. This, what you see here on the left of this picture is a chain of states. I label them one, two, three, all the way to some integer n. If you look carefully and are able to count, you find in this example, n is 11, but n could be any number. It could be very large, could be very small. 
but this is the prototype of models I'm looking at. In such a model, the, the object can be in n different states. The different states, all this n, which is in this model looks like 11, 11 different states tell you exactly the classical states this model can be in. So I'm discussing here a classical model. And the law of evolution for this classical model is extremely simple. It just says there's a clock on the background somewhere, the clock is ticking. And at every tick of the clock, whenever your particle were in position number zero, it goes to position number one. If the particle is in position number one, you get the next beat of the clock, it will go to position number two. And so on until it arrives at the position n minus one. When the clock ticks again, it doesn't go to n, it goes to zero. So it's circular. This model is a circular model and the evolution law is indicated by an integer k, k running from zero to 10 in this example. And the evolution law can be written down in a notation that looks like quantum mechanics, but it isn't quantum mechanics because I'm not using any Schrodinger equation at this point. I just use the law of evolution, classical evolution. And the classical evolution, I can represent that by a matrix, an 11 by 11 matrix saying this matrix contains zeros and ones on every row and every column, there are n minus one zeros and there's one entry that's one. This matrix acts on a vector K, which has zeros everywhere, except where the particle is sitting, there it has a one. So you can imagine how this works mathematically. This acting in this matrix on the state where K has a, has a certain integer value from zero to 10, then it gives you the next value, which in this example is just uh, zero. It, well, it's one to 11, but 11 to one is replaced by, by zero again. So that uh, it, so this, this goes round and round and round. We also say mathematically that K, that U acting on K is K plus one modulo N. And this matrix here is written as if it were quantum mechanics by zero in terms of zeros and ones. But even, even though it's classical, you can still look at it as a matrix and you can try to find a matrix called H such that U is E to the minus I H times Delta T where Delta T is the time it takes for the clock to, to give its next beat. This is actually mathematically an easy exercise. I'll show you very briefly how it's done. But if you have such an H, you can also write down the state psi and say d dt of psi is minus i h of psi. Where h is just the matrix, the, the, yeah, the matrix that solves this equation. And if you have this equation, you can check that this is indeed obeyed by the state at every integer value, at every value of time that is an integer multiple of the beats of the clock, you will find exactly the state that your system will be in. So this is a way to write down classical evolution in a quantum notation. It is only notation, it's nothing more than that. So at this point, this is, this is how you turn a classical theory into a quantum theory by just doing this mathematics. In practice, the mathematics, for anybody with some practice of mathematics finds this very easy. This is what we call the discrete Fourier transform or the fast Fourier transform where you're not integrating, but you're just making a sum over 11 entries. Here are all the, the 11 states are integrated by K being zero to 10. This is an exponential, e to the two pi i times K times N divided by capital N. And you have to sum this over all values of K. Then you get a new quantum-like state I call N, but this quantum state now is no longer describing any particle in any position, it describes these things as a superposition. The reason for doing this is, well, eventually we want to understand how quantum mechanics works, but right now it's also a convenient way to solve this equation, but to write down the general solution in a closed term. The general solution is that these are the eigenstates of the operator U. Those eigenstates I can write down as e to the minus i, uh, uh, 2 pi times, uh, times n, little n divided by big N. And then um, it's very easy to find the corresponding matrix H. 
So to find the matrix H, you have to do this calculation and you'll find N states, which are the eigenstates of this U and you'll find N different eigenvalues for U. All you have to do now is write them as E to the minus I, E every time. And then you get the, the um, uh, way the, the matrix H that, that tells you how these states evolve. So this, what I write down here is just a mathematical trick. It is not particularly difficult to solve them. What you find are N values for this, this number little n, the capital N values, the little n is, is uh, the indicating which bar you're looking at. These you can regard as energy levels. This state has N energy levels. They are equally spaced as it turns out to be. So this is the solution of the Schrodinger equation for this model. You'll find 11 different states at all at the same distance from each other. And uh, by the time you reach number 11, you're at the highest possible state. You can write down more eigenstates, but actually they are mathematically identical to the previous ones. So you have to stop after, in this model, after 11 steps. And um, you'll find this quantum mechanical system. There's one interesting mathematical question you can ask. You can ask what happens if I take this number n very, very large. Then you get what I call the continuum limit. This is the same picture as I had before, but now I take the continuum limit. The particle can be at any state on this circle. So now it becomes a more mathematically advanced way of, of writing at things. The particle can be anywhere. The sum I had before changes into a loop integral, the integral going around this loop. And here you get the sum again, but now the sum goes all the way to infinity. You go through the same mathematics, you find the same answer. You find equidistant elementary quantum states for the system, but now you get an infinite sequence of, of states, starting at zero, and they're all equally spaced, all they go to infinity. Now you might, if you have some experience in quantum mechanics, you might immediately make an important remark, say this looks exactly like the energy, the energy level levels of the harmonic quantum oscillator. So the quantum harmonic oscillator has exactly the same states. So what I can also say is that this thing going around in circles now is a classical model that is mathematically identical to the harmonic oscillator in the quantum harmonic oscillator. Because the quantum harmonic oscillator has these level energy levels also. And actually you can say every state the quantum oscillator can be in, I can map them to a state for this classical theory, except that most states you usually look at in the harmonic oscillator are superpositions of states of this thing. But the superpositions don't mean so much. If you want, you can say that the superposition coefficients represent probabilities. If you want, if you don't want, you can just say these are superpositions period. And my model allows me to make these superpositions. There's no further physical consequence of that. It doesn't change the model at all. But you can say, I can now also treat the model using probabilities by taking that the squares of the coefficients of you, if you superpose your states will represent probabilities. That is your choice. It doesn't matter mathematically. This is all equivalent to, to doing the same thing. Question? I think yes, I didn't ahead. understand this example. So where is stochastic, stochastic some white noise? Or, I mean, why is this model different from quantum mechanical model. It so, is not it, different from the quantum mechanical model, sorry to interrupt, uh, but I have not yet reached the point of dealing with stochastic, stochastic effects. There's nothing stochastic in this model. It is completely deterministic, as you can see. So I started why? completely, come on, I started a completely deterministic model, and I'll introduce later what I mean by sto stochastic, because in the very end, you're totally right, in the very end, you want the theory that reproduces the stochastic properties of quantum mechanics. Absolutely right, but I haven't reached that point yet. So, so let me consider some coupled harmonic oscillator pain. So we, we know classically in classical mechanics how to solve and, but in this case, we also have some matrix vision, but then so I, still I don't, it, 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 it right. is just a quantum mechanics model. Your no, question, no. I understand yeah. your question. Your question is very well posed. 
and it's absolutely right. I have not yet reached the stage to, to, to discuss that. So I, I am okay. not discussing part of the chain, but I will. And what it will look a little bit like is next picture I was just talking about to show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here, Thank you. What you see here is many harmonic oscillators. And so, but with different periods, some take a long time to go around, some go very fast. So, but I still have a clock that beats at one, with one beat at a time. But now I can start in any one of these yellow boxes. I can start here, I can start here, I can, and any of these, there are more than N now boxes. And the rule is again clear. The rule is you make one step in this chain, but you see, you can return to the same value you were at before without having reached any of these. So if you are here in this, in this circle here, you'll stay in, in, in this loop forever. If you're in a small loop, you stay in a small loop forever. If you're in any of these loops, you stay in the same loop. So this is the next step. The next step is you can say a more realistic model of the universe will be that you have a choice. You can have, you can be in different states of this oscillator, which each have different periodicities. So this is simply the next step, a little bit closer to what you are talking about, because you were thinking of having an infinite sequence of harmonic oscillators in an infinite chain. Well, that will be a next step again to add infinity here. Say, I don't have uh, six different models. I have infinitely many different models that my system can be in. Then what? It still is not stochastic. I have not introduced probabilities at all. I'm saying, however, you can, if you want, introduce probabilities if you, if you want to. Then you can say, I have a chance down here. There's another chance I'm here, another chance I'm here. And if I know these chances today, I know what these chances are tomorrow and the day after all the time. The chances will always be the same distribution because the rest of the model is completely deterministic. So this is how I will talk about our models, but I'm not going, I'm time to go very slow. And so I haven't yet reached stage of making infinitely many oscillators, but I will come to that. So it's a very important question. So right now you see that, that every single model of this kind has a certain sequence of, of eigenstates. So this thing here has only six eigenstates. This thing here has eight. The one inside is only three. And here, this is a 12 and this is two and so on. So all these different oscillators are there. Now, if you have in such a world, what are the energy levels in this world? Well, I have six different oscillators. Therefore, I have, uh, or, or I think it's, no, it's five here. Yeah? Sorry, I'm five different oscillators here. So every oscillator here has its own sequence of states. There is this little thing with only two states has them very widely separated. Uh, the big os oscillator, which has 12 states here, has them more closely separated here. So there, there's this sequence, there's that sequence, there's that sequence, and so on. So now I see that if you have a model where you, whenever you go around and you reach the state, same state where you had where you were before, without having hit all the others yet, but you can also be in, start in any of these other things, you have this situation that the energy levels form a more complicated pattern. What I can do next is put all these patterns together. So what I'm doing next is say, well, I squeeze all these. And if you look carefully, when you squeeze all these together into one sequence of energy levels, you find it looks a lot more complicated now. Actually, this looks a little bit more realistic. Maybe the energy level spectrum of our universe is as complicated as this. So when you see an energy spectrum as complicated as this, you might have the idea, let's try to, to disentangle them. Maybe what I'm looking at is just a whole collection of these equally spaced energy levels. In that case, my model is actually one of these. So I hope this is very clear because this is an important next step that I've been making. I put a model, I take a model where, where you don't have a single row of state, which have very many of them. Then the energy spectrum starts to look like this. That's the short message that comes out of this exercise. And you can go into more mathematical steps. However, in all these cases, the Hamiltonian is periodic in energy. If you go back to the previous state here, you look carefully that here you encounter the same energy level as here. If you have a discrete clock, then this state here is the same as that state there. And what I'm saying in this part of, um, of our theory, I have a ground state, which people can call the vacuum. But if you have a finite clock that makes ticks, 
you also have the highest energy state. If you try to get higher, you encounter the original energy states again and again and again. So there's not only a vacuum state, there's a state I call the anti-vacuum. The anti-vacuum is the highest energy state. Now it so happens that I've also been in investigating black hole physics, where at some point time turns around. So you go into a black hole, you go into a region where time runs backwards, backwards compared to what time does here. So if time runs backwards, the energy energy levels are also backwards, and so what was the vacuum state originally then becomes the anti-vacuum, the completely filled state. So Dirac encountered such a situation in his theory of electrons, that you can have the vacuum state for electrons, but you can also have a state where the, state, where the whole system is completely filled with electrons. And he called that the full state. But here I'm saying you can have the same thing with the vacuum. There could be a completely filled state, which I call the anti-vacuum. I'm not going to use the anti-vacuum very much in this talk, but later you can imagine if we want to do the, the mathematics and want to, to extend our, our mathematical understanding as well as possible, you have to realize that many of your models will contain an anti-vacuum besides of the vacuum. And as I said just before, it's important in black holes because in black holes, the time can switch to minus time and so on. So all the models are produced. Excuse after, me. Yes, go Excuse ahead. Excuse me. Uh, could you tell me the, what is the essential difference between the, uh, the ontological states and the quantum states? There, there is no uh, some essential difference there. There is no essential difference. Mathematically, you don't see the difference between quantum mechanics and this. So mathematically, I'm saying that the models I had before, this model is a deterministic model because for every point here, you know exactly which other point you write at. But now I can take this, this deterministic model, I can diagonalize the evolution operator of this, this model, and I get an energy spectrum for its eigenvalues that looks like this. And you have to use this energy spectrum as if you are doing quantum mechanics. So what I'm saying now is, this is neither classical nor quantum mechanics. It's a model that you can write down classically in this notation. You can write down quantum mechanically in this notation. From a mathematical point of view, these models are identical. This model is that model, but I just wrote the energy eigenstates of it. That's all I've, I've done. My claim is this is all you can do in quantum mechanics. If you do it right, you will find that our universe is a model of this sort. But I didn't tell you yet how to get this model. When you see the universe, we, what, we, what we know of the universe today is called the standard model of the elementary particles. That's the best way to describe the model. If you add to that some theory of gravity, you're done. But we have a difficulty, as you know, with adding gravity to everybody's satisfaction in that model. So we don't know that. But we know the standard model pretty well. And we can give any credit to the assignment, now derive what the standard model looks in this notation. The graduate student will probably come back empty handed saying this question is too difficult for me. I don't know how to do it. No, I'm investigating the question. It is very, very difficult to do this. But in principle, it should be possible because there's a lot of information in this line spectrum here. And I think that the information is just a hidden way of to inform that this is the actual reality we are looking at. But it's important and please keep asking such questions because. So I'm saying right now, there is no difference between classical theories and quantum theories, but that's because I have not yet- Excuse me, I have a question. Yes. Uh, could you go back to the uh, previous page? Yes. Okay, yes. so here in deterministic uh, cellular automata, can you jump from one, for example, in the inner circle evolution to outer circle among the different uh, closed path? Very good question again, not without making a change in the theory. You can make a change to say if the model, if the particle ends up here, it doesn't continue to the, to the next one here, but it jumps. And what you can do is you can make the jump dependent on where, where the other particles are. So if this particle sits here, and if this particle arrives here, then it jumps. If this particle sits somewhere else, it does not jump. Now I've made it fundamentally more complicated. It still is very simple from a quantum mechanical point of view, but also, it, then this would be the wrong model. I could then rewrite the model and say, now I have a very long periodic chain, and but I still, still may have others which are shorter. The model will still look like this. So mathematically speaking, I haven't done very much. 
But uh, again, your question is well posed, but please keep it because I'm, I'm actually going to do this, this kind of exercise explicitly just to explain how to come closer to a model of physics. So yes, I'm going to do that, but you say, but I haven't done it yet. It's, it's again, something that has to be done with lots of care, as you might imagine. One more question, Professor. Yes. Uh, if you come back again to the previous slide, does it mean that when uh, the particle goes uh, in a certain circle, uh, it jumps from one position to another is deterministic. But yes. if it uh, jumps to another circle, it is random. And we have to no. know what is probability. No, no, I'm not saying that. Uh, this model will always be deterministic. If you, if I do as you say, if I say it, 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 it jumps randomly, then I've deserted. Then I no longer have a deterministic theory. And I am after finding deterministic theories. My claim is every deterministic theory has basically this structure because all I have to do is go, uh, go on, 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 on until I reach the point, I, a point I've reached before. That point does not sit here as you can clearly see. You can clearly see that because this model is very small. If I take a very, very big model, it's sometimes very hard to see whether I go back to a point where I've been before. Take the entire universe. The universe is not going to back to its Poincaré cycle very quickly. So there we, we, we don't see this happening. But in smaller models, you see that after a certain amount of time, you go back to the same spot. But how particle uh, knows that it should uh, jump to the next uh, position in the certain uh, circle rather than jump into another one. When clock ticking, what yeah. should should particle do from one state to another one? What the particle should do is written down in this picture. I can write it down in the equations if I want. I can say I have an operator U which contains ones and zeros. It contains a one that tells you where the particle is going, contains a zero if the particle is not going to that spot, period. There's nothing more than one and zero on this matrix. I can diagonalize that matrix, turn it into a Schrodinger equation, then that's the quantum model. There's no stochasticity anywhere. So okay. in, this model, in this model, every particle has a very precisely defined rule as to where it should go. It is only allowed to go to follow its line. It's not allowed to jump, not at this stage. I am going to consider jumps, however, but they're more technical than, than what you think. And um, but in, at this stage, there's no jump, and so there's no stochasticity. But I can always introduce quantum superpositions of these states, and I say whenever I'm in a quantum superposition, I will stay in a quantum superposition forever. So both, if I have a position of superposition of two states, both states will evolve, but one will never come close to the other or take over or something. No, you will always keep the same superposition. So superpositions are relatively easy here. Also handling probabilities is very easy in this model. We are not learning very much, however, not at this stage. But I have to do some more steps to explain to you wh why, how this can be made much more resembling real quantum mechanics. Okay, thank so you. The next pages. Yes. Can I ask a question? Does each yes. system have its own clock? Yes, so I do have a clock, but as you saw in one of the previous slides, I can take the continuum limit. Yes. Then everything goes with a very smooth clock, as it were, and you don't notice the presence of the clock anymore. It doesn't change very much in the physics, because whether I have a circle without clocks or a circle that says tick, 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 it doesn't make too much difference mathematically. So it looks, it looks as though it's not very expensive. Look. Yes. But it, but it looks as though each system has its own independent clock. Yes. It has a clock. And, uh, but if you, you can now start to complain about general relativity. And that, yes. that's a very well taken uh, observation that in general relativity, it seems that there's no exterior clock. There's only an intrinsic clock that yes. the theory evolves into itself. But you can, try to define such an intrinsic clock, it's much more difficult to do. So yes, our, our land into such difficulties, particularly when we introduce gravity, we'll have to ask this question again and again and again. And, but, but you're too quick in answering, asking these questions. I'm not yet anywhere close to, uh, to studying that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so 
this is actually the question that you really have been asking. Can we generate, can we mimic genuine quantum mechanics, the real quantum thing, like the real Schrodinger equation for a particle in a box or something like that? Can we do that? The answer is yes, but it is not easy. So suppose that we want to, to understand the particle in a box or a particle in a harmonic oscillator. Well, when the particle sits in a harmonic oscillator, yes, then we can use exactly this one sing, single circle. But when a particle sits in a box, it hits against the walls, its periodicity can vary. And my situation in now becomes a lot more complicated. And then the question is legitimate. Can I turn this into a quantum model? And the answer, yes, but it's quite a bit more complicated. And now I'm going to add an, an ingredient that brings me back to ordinary quantum mechanics in a much more uh, imaginative way, I'm going to introduce a background. Well, originally that was against the rule, but let's assume that the background also follows the rules. So the background is deterministic, but in contrast with the rest of the theory, it is very fast. So the, the, the background has its own clock and that clock is much, much faster than the clocks that are eventually interested in. So that is like looking at a television screen with black noise, but the black noise is going as fast as, as the, the electronics of the, of the television set can follow. So you see, you see so much blinking that it looks like gray instead of black or white. It doesn't look black, it doesn't look white. It looks gray because the, the, the blinking goes so fast that you cannot follow. Now that is a theory that already goes, is going to look like quantum mechanics a lot more than what I had before. So now let's look at that and then um, I'm going to look at the energy eigenstates of this system. So that's quite a big step you have to imagine, but um, this is a theory with, with uh, fast fluctuating variables. I have to speed up my talk a little bit because I want to reach the final stages. I'm not going very fast. So I'm going to skip over some of these arguments. But um, as I said in this, in this uh, transparency, there's a white noise is going to be added to it. And now this is more like a genuine cellular automaton. If you make an arbitrary cellular automaton, you have an arbitrary evolution law, you see it blink also very fast as if it has white noise in its vacuum state. This, my claim is then you do really get quantum mechanics as you know it, including the stochastic behavior. So what you have now, and this is very important, I have fast variables and I have slow variables. That is the next real step of sophistication in the theory that I need to make. So again, I have energy levels. So in principle, this looks just like the models I had before, nothing changed, except there's two sets of energy levels. There are the slow energy levels, which are now going to describe the quantum theory I'm interested in, which is here. This is a logarithmic scale for the energy levels. So when I go high up, I get energy levels hundreds of times far, far higher than here. And there are very many of those. They all also equally separated, but the separation between these energy levels is much, much bigger than these. Now imagine this theory and now say, this is real quantum mechanics. Suppose our world looks like this. What happens if I apply thermodynamics? Thermodynamics hasn't been mentioned yet, but in thermodynamics, you can say that if the thing is in somewhat near a thermal equilibrium, then I'll get equipartition. The states with high energy are suppressed by small Boltzmann factors. The Boltzmann factors for all these states are so small that at first approximation, I can neglect them all. Then I only get the slow energy spectra and the slow energy spectra will obey my rules of being, being possible to, to combine them to, to uh, make this thing deterministic. My claim is now the following. The world as we know it has its energy spectrum more or less arranged like this. There are very fast fluctuating variables, which for that reason have a very wide separated energy levels, which are all not occupied because of thermodynamics. Their Boltzmann factors are too small. You can also compare the situation with, a, um, uh, with the standard model, which contains particles that are too heavy for us to see. In the standard model, there are perhaps Higgs particles or other particles that we have not yet understood because the LHC has not been able to reach those particles. Those particles will all be sitting in the ground state, not moving at all, only making slight changes in the model. 
So now I'm, I'm going to say, yes, this is going to be my theory, but there will be interactions between these states and this one. And now the interactions are of the kinds you already had the discussion discussed using the, the questions. In the question, the one the question was, can you hop over from these levels to these levels? Now I'm saying in this picture, yes, that we, I will introduce the possibility that every now and then a particle hops from here to here or hops from here to here. I'll just add that as a possible law in the, in the, in the game. However, those events where a particle interacts with particles from the background are rare. Uh, I'm postulating now that yes, every now and then the particle in this world interacts with the particle in this world, but the interactions occur rarely, only every now and then. And um, this happens if, if, for instance, compare now the treatment of the standard model, but the standard model contains the particles we know, but also contains the particles we don't know yet. That's why it works so badly today, because there probably there are many particles that we have not yet been able to open up to see what they are like, because they haven't been produced. Their, their fields have not yet been excited. So now I have many very short circles in my theory, the short circuits are, are going around so fast that the energy levels are very far away from each other due to thermodynamics, due to the fact that these high energy levels could not be reached by hand in any possible way. I don't see those fast fluctuating variables. So real quantum mechanics comes about when you, you have all these levels, but you missed them all because you couldn't see them. But now I can imagine those energy levels to be there. Then I get a model that looks much, much better like quantum mechanics that you know of than before. You get that these very many, very high energy states form a background of highly fluctuating states, so highly fluctuating that it look like white noise. Now I'm in a situation that I can add particles that may be unstable, that can decay with an exponential decay law and so on. So, so this is the, the main rule is now that, yes, you have fast variables, but we cannot follow them. We cannot measure them. Therefore, we encounter the real quantum mechanical nature of our world because we are missing out on looking at those fast vibrating particles. And then by doing that, you get a new and interesting situation. Now the theory looks much more like quantum mechanics. I'm going a bit faster because I wanted to go into the consequences of such a theory. And um, my claim is that. Um, uh, well, that what happens, it now happens, it, it looks very much like the things that happen in a cellular automaton in, in practice. A cellular automaton contains particles that move very slowly around, and they're very fast linking things that make these slow moving objects behave like behaving at random. So now you see I have a, I have a classical model with random behavior uh, put in, but uh, the behavior is random because the universe is so large. So these classical states in the high energy mode can vibrate, but in a very short time, they go through all possible states they can go through. So they look actually like a multiverse and all these things people talk about. But now I've introduced them in a way that looks much more like deterministic. So the universe is deterministic, but only if you are able to follow exactly everything that happens in these particles. Uh, let me see. Well. Um, how to go about solving the problem? Can I? Yeah. So, is this line of thought? I mean, so the resulting equation is different from Popper Planck type equation. So, you know, so in classical mechanics, if we introduce some stochastic noise, or whatever, then eventually we will have some Popper Planck some equation. So, yeah. this kind of thing. So starting from Newtonian equation, introducing some stochasticity, can you derive Schrodinger equation instead of a focal Planck equation or so I'm yeah. Absolutely a good question. Yes, my claim is yes, because basically this model is like the first models are introduced. They are very simple, they are deterministic, but only deterministic if I take this fluctuating background into account. I take all the states the fluctuating background can be in, then it becomes deterministic. But imagine that's so much work to think of every single fluctuating object at every point in space and time, it's hopeless to follow all that behavior. So the Hoca Planck equation will work very, very well. But now I have 
set it up in such a way that I can see how to turn this into a deterministic theorem. In principle, all the states are deterministic. So every single fast fluctuating variable can be in L states. L's are not, the L's are the ends that I had before, but now there are very, very many of them. And now I can ask, uh, how do I set up a theory and how can I reproduce the, Sch the Schrodinger equation that I want? How can I reproduce the Hamiltonian that I want? And what I'll, now, I'll do now is I'll show a method to produce the Hamiltonian out of a deterministic theory. The big question will then be, is that the right deterministic theory I chose? That is a very difficult question and I cannot answer, but I can, I can answer the question, how can I make a model that looks like the model I want to produce? For that, I introduced the Pauli matrices, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. They are two by two matrices, and they will be acting whenever a particle makes a decision. Do I go this direction? Do I go that direction? And now I have to say, well, this time, there'll be a new ingredient in the theory saying the particle can go in this direction or it can go in that direction. But that depends on where the fast fluctuating variables are. Well, they're going so fast, I can't follow them. I can't tell you where they are. So because of that, I can only give you a quantum amplitude. But if I could follow these fast moving variables very fast, then I could write down exactly the quantum amplitude for the particle to go either this direction or that direction because it's now deterministic. So it's a Fokker Planck equation, but a deterministic Fokker Planck equation, which only generates random numbers because our universe is so big. If the universe were as tiny as a few Planck lengths, it wouldn't be random anymore. It would be completely deterministic. But no, our universe is very, very large. All these random oscillators uh, interact with each other, not very, very intensely, but sufficiently to make it hopelessly uh, non-periodic and, uh, uh, and stochastic looking. So I, I introduced the, the, the Pauli matrices, which can be in two states. One state is that the particle went this way, the other state is that the particle goes that way. And to introduce a flip operation. So the, um, the unitary operator that tells you whether the particle goes this or that way is an operator which gives you a flip. And that flip is that one of these power matrices will serve as a flip operator. This actually is only is not is a power matrix that tells you which, which of the two states are you in. Are you in the flipping state or in the non-flipping state? These two say I make the flip, but they can make it in two ways. So that is, I still can control the phase that I put in. The phase has no physical effect, so strictly speaking. Sigma one and sigma two are not distinguishable distingu distingu from each other. But in practice, they are, when you do the mathematics, they are different. And they have the same mathematical properties that the Pauli matrices normally have. But now I want to write a Hamiltonian that generates that flip. And Hamiltonian is relatively easy to get. You have to take these Pauli matrices, but multiply them with a constant alpha, which is always one half pi. It's not one quarter pi, not one third pi. It must be one half pi. Why? Well, e to the power one half pi times i times these matrices gives you this matrix again. If it were not one half pi but something else, then it would become a superposition. All four entities of the matrix would be different from zero. That would be a quantum superposition. So now, postulating that I have a deterministic theory that is mimicking from quantum mechanics is the same as postulating that these coefficients are exactly one half pi and nothing else. It's nice, it's not nice what they get out of this. If it's one half pi, it's deterministic, but it isn't really quantum mechanics. So now you can say that this theory will be quantum mechanics only if it makes these alphas one and a half pi, but not in the other case. But I want to mimic real quantum mechanics. In real quantum mechanics, I often have the power matrix with very different coefficients. So I want these alphas to be different from zero. Actually, I want them to be very, very tiny. If they're very tiny, you have another mathematical machine at your disposal that's better than the Schrodinger equation because it gives you faster the probabilities. And I'll tell you that in a moment. I have a machine as follows. I can make, take my flip operator, but now I say the flip only takes place if, one, if all the fast moving particles are in certain positions. That's what I said be, before about the unstable particle. So the unstable particle reacts only if the, if the fast variables in the uh, Im in immediate surroundings take certain values. Then I have to multiply the Hamiltonian with the Kronecker delta function. That doesn't change anything. It doesn't make these alpha smaller or bigger. 
there's still one half pi, all of them, but now they're multiplied by delta functions. Those delta functions are zero most of the time, but every now and then a delta pops up and then it, the particle makes a flip. So classically, this is completely deterministic. But now I have an operator which I can say is very small, but in what way is it small? Well, its expectation value is very small because if this fluctuating background is stochastically moving, then at every single moment, the probability of these axes being realized is very, very small. So the vacuum expectation value of this interaction apparently is very small. It has the same one as before with the coefficient alpha being one half pi. This is the power matrix. But now there's a one over L1 times L2 also in expression. This is the expectation that the, the fluctuating variables have the right value. So you see, I'm combining quantum mechanics with stochastic physics. This you could call stochastic physics, but I'm using quantum notation to describe it. But I, what I describe gives me something that looks very much like the standard model because I have an interaction Hamiltonian just like the standard model. And I, it is very small because of these L's just like the standard model. And I have a way to solve it mathematically, just like a standard model. What I can do is I can do a perturbation expansion, but making a sequence of terms, writing down Feynman diagrams for all these terms that tells you this very small coefficient comes in once, comes in twice, comes in three times. I'm doing the perturbation expansion. I'm terminating the perturbation expansion whenever the next term is so small that it doesn't make any difference anymore. That is exactly what you do in quantum field theory. So I claim now we have to do the same thing as a quantum field theory, but now I know what the interaction Hamiltonian is. The interaction Hamiltonian is a Pauli matrix times a coefficient on a pi, which I should not forget, times a number which is very small if the hidden fast moving variables can move in very, very different, many different positions. Only in one position, this term pops up. So this term on the average is very small and the method is accurate because I may make this assumption that this background is fluctuating more or less randomly. So now the notion of random fluctuations does come in. And um, um, now the theory I get, I get out looks much more like quantum mechanics. Yes, I've been skipping, skipping some uh, slides because I'm moving towards the final slide. I, ho I hope I have some time. I, I think if, if you have sufficient time, it doesn't matter. You, oh, okay. you, you basically, you have one hour and 30 minutes originally. Oh, so, you, if we, yeah, so yeah, everything is up yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah, Let's take the time. Yeah. I'll, I'll take my time in that case. So, okay, I'm flexible. So now this is my Hamiltonian, but this is not different, not fundamentally different from what you have in a standard model. In the standard model, you have oscillating fields. Most of those fields are in harmonic oscillators, which means that I know exactly how, how they go in circles. But then every now and then, there is an interaction Hamiltonian acting, but it is very small because the, the coefficients L are very big. The harmonic oscillators go, the fast variables go into loops, but the loops contain many elements. Sufficient number of elements to, take, to make it very long lasting before this interaction Hamiltonian acts. So assuming that only it only acts a final number of times when uh, when you um, sorry. it uh, interacts very many uh, very few times because it's so slow. And uh, uh, that means that you can forget the terms where the interaction Hamiltonian acts more than five times or something like that, because that happens so rarely that it doesn't make any difference to ignore that. That's of course also what you do when you solve the Fokker Planck equation. So, but now you see that this has the same quantum notation. It's a quantum operator on one hand, but it generates stochastic behavior on the other hand because the underlying theory is deterministic, but it, um, yeah, uh, it has the, um, uh, uh, it is defined originally in a deterministic way. So you see that the two different languages now come together where everybody like, like John Bell, like uh, Zeiling and all these people do quantum mechanics say it's impossible to combine quantum mechanics with classical behavior with Fokker Planck equations. No, uh, this, it uh, agrees very well with these equations. You can use once 
this description or the other description. In one description, it looks like quantum mechanics. In the other description, it looks like classical. But actually, I claim it is quantum mechanics. So um, we, are, we are using quantum terminology to describe a classical model. But the classical model is far too difficult for us to solve. The universe is far too big to figure out what happens when every now and then uh, a stochastic variable takes the right value. It's possible, but it's hopelessly difficult. It becomes easy if you use the language of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is making things easier, not more difficult, as people would like to think. They think that the easy theory is a deterministic one. The complicated theory is quantum mechanics. No, it is the other way around. Quantum mechanics is a magnificent mathematical tool to deal with this extremely complicated situation we're talking about, where we don't see 99% of the degrees of freedom of nature because they are oscillating too fast. So, however, there is a catch. And this now, so I'm now going to step three in my argument. I, I arrived at a model which I'm very pleased about because it looks like quantum mechanics on the one and, and classically on the other. But I have one problem, and that is nasty people who have grown up for with 100 years of quantum mechanics will ask me nasty questions. And yes, please ask nasty questions. So one thing is, what about all those paradoxes that we have derived? Bell has derived the Bell inequality. It's being violated by quantum mechanics. Uh, there are many other paradoxes, the GHC uh, paradox. There are many other paradoxes that you can find in the, in the literature, which all say that if you have a measuring device and at the last moment you rotate your measuring device to, to change the thing that you want to observe, then you end up in a paradox. The paradox tells you there is no classical theory that describes the situation. How come that I'm nevertheless getting a classical theory and I'm claiming that it generates quantum mechanics? The answer to that question is actually very easy, deceptively easy. It is that in this, there's one thing I cannot do in my models, which is change the ontological basis. The ontological basis is the basis in quantum field theory where I'm not looking at the energy eigenstates, I'm looking at where all these balls are, exactly where they are. That's the ontological basis. But if I use that basis, I cannot go to a different ontological basis because if I do, I go to a basis where these balls are in a superposition. Now there's one extra ingredient in the theory I haven't yet told you. That is this, the Big Bang ages and ages ago started in a deterministic mode. The balls I'm talking about were in some initial position. What the position was, I don't care much about, but it was in an ontological deterministic position. It was not in a superposition. So when John Bell does his experiment, he takes his photons in this case, they are in a certain ontological phase that you can do your measurements. And now you see Bob and Alice in his uh, setup make a little change in the device. Now, now they're looking at superpositions of photons. I'm saying no, Bob and Alice cannot do that because the universe, when it started, started in a deterministic mode. It will stay in a deterministic mode forever. And that I call the ontological conservation law. So the universe started in a way that all these balls were in one position, they were not in a superposition. <laughs> so superpositions are not allowed in this theory. And uh, that is a new step which I haven't yet mentioned before, that not all choices of basis are equally physical. So what John Bell does, what Zeilinger and all the other people do when they do quantum mechanics, is they assume that you can freely move from one basis to another base, a basis and describe all these different choices of basis in ontological theory. No, if I make the, take the universe, I take the initial state of the universe, I put that in a superposition of states, that is not a state that is allowed in my description. That superposition would allow Bob and Alice in, the, in their setting to go to a superposition of states. Otherwise, they would not be allowed to do so. So this is the limitation, the restriction that people have forgotten to impose on your theory that the universe itself cannot make a superposition, a, a transition towards a superposition of states. It looks like it can. And now this is the final chapter uh, of my procedure that it looks as if you can make superpositions because that's what John, what, what Bob and Alice are doing in John Bell's experiment, as if they can go to different superpositional states. No, they cannot. 
which is the same statement as saying Bob and Alice have no free will. The free will was dictated as soon as the universe started running with the balls in certain positions. At that moment, Bob and Alice already had made a decision. There's no way for them to change it to any other basis. And that takes away the, the paradoxical, the counter uh, intuitive component of quantum mechanics. There's a so called possibility of making counterfactual experiments. Experiments that you cannot do because you cannot superimpose two states. Uh, but um, uh, let's say, let's say in a different formulation, what, I, what, I, what we can do is that Bob and Alice in John Bell's experiment have the free will to, when they throw the dice, they have the possibility of throwing the dice and get a three. They have the possibility when they throw the dice and they get a six, they can get a five, they can get a two. When they throw a dice, they can get the die can come in any value. When you throw dice, the dice cannot go into a value where it's a superposition of a six and a three. That's impossible. And that means that Bob and Alice cannot really go into a superposition of states. And that, according to many people in quantum mechanics, would be saying that Bob and Alice have no free will. Well, you can use those words, you can also ignore them. My classical underlying theory doesn't know about what free will is, but it does know that every single ball is in a particular position and not in a superposition. The superposition can be chosen if you want to describe probabilities, if you want to, but then you cannot at the same time say that Bob and Alice can go from one state into a superposition of other states. That is not allowed. So that is why there is no real contradiction with, between quantum mechanics and the standard theory. Um, so question, then, and is, then can you explain Bell's inequality? I mean, usually we learned, I mean, without that kind of concept, entanglement and support. I've, I've been trying to say that, but to say it right is very difficult. I'm saying that Bob and Alice in Bell's experiment can choose how to put their detector, but they cannot put the detector in a superposition of states. And that was assumed by Bell that if they put the detector in a superposition of two states, then they'll measure the photon being a superposition of three photons. Yes, but the universe doesn't allow them to. It cannot, the detector can be rotated, but that rotation has a history in the minds of Bob and Alice. The universe was still deterministic at all stages, but Bob and Alice cannot make a, a cannot choose a setting where the setting is, is itself a superposition. That is impossible, and that means that this way I take away the the contradiction. Many people have said things like this, so I, I'm probably not the first at all to say these things. But it's hard to to understand what you're saying when you make such a statement. What I'm saying is now that I can write down classical theories that behave exactly right, but those classical theories do not allow me to consider quantum superpositions just like that. The quantum superpositions are not probabilities, but we can treat them as if they were probabilities, mm -hmm. because that helps when you want to do a calculation. But if you, do say, if you want to take all the degrees of freedom into account of all these fast fluctuating objects, you can say, no, if you take them all into account, they are only in ontological states, not the superpositions of states. So this is just saying that I'm, I'm saying no to the question. No, you're not allowed to ask this question. So that's a different answer than the Copenhagen answer. The Copenhagen answer is you can ask the questions, the answer will bring you nowhere. I'm saying you're not allowed to ask the question because the question is, is silly, is, is nonsensical. The question is, is not the correct question because in the classical theory, you cannot ask for a superposition of states. But you, you can make it look like you are a superposition of states, but that's your own responsibility. You can use it in your calculations as you want, but in reality, the world will not be in that kind of superposition at all. So that is the bottom line, which makes things work. But I'm still not ready with my talk. There still is a problem. So yes, I said, you must have determinism all the way, saying that from day one onwards, this universe was in a deterministic state. It will stay in that state forever. But as soon as Bob and Alice are choosing a superposition, they are deviating from this picture. They're making a mistake. That is the bottom line. You have a question? 
Yeah, I have a question. Uh, does this cellular automata have a uh, Hilbert space structure built in? Not by itself. It is a cellular automaton made by, you can make it by a computer. You can take a computer, you can instruct the computer what to do. You can program the computer. Is there Hilbert space in the computer? No, there's no Hilbert space in the computer. There's only a computer program in the computer. Similarly, in a cellular automaton, the only thing that is there is the, the computer that does the computation, not the Hilbert space. But I'm free to introduce Hilbert space because it, it helps a lot. It helps me to do a perturbation expansion, which brings me the answer much, much faster than trying to compute for every probability what happens because I'll never get the answer. It's too complicated. So, um, yes, but then there's one, there's still a question. Uh, oh yes, the statement now is I can make, I can perform now the one over L expansion. And that is a genuine expansion, but it only makes sense if L is an integer. Because I was working with integers all the time. I cannot work with, with fractional numbers, not unless they're rational, then I can replace the rational numbers or integer numbers according to some prescription. But you, I cannot work with arbitrary real numbers in this theory. So the values of one over L are rational, and this means that the coefficients that come with these interaction Hamiltonians are rational coefficients. Those rational coefficients tell me that in the, in the standard model, these coefficients are the constants of nature, like the fine structure constant, one of 137. So in the standard model, I don't know what the number is. I can replace it by any real number I like and do the perturbation expansion. Same thing here. I can replace one of L by any number I like and do the perturbation expansion. But physically, you should expect the one of L to be a rational number. L is an integer, and I can put some integer on, on top as well. So, so I can make this, this a, a rational number. But the rational number should be believed. The non-rational number should not be believed, as if someone has done, not done his job right yet. Because if this number is not rational, with a real number like pi, then I still have an infinite number of decimal places to solve before I can calculate anything. That's not a deterministic theory. So if, if L is not integer or rational, I don't have a deterministic theory. If I assume to have a deterministic theory, I can eventually expect that this theory will give me a prediction for the find such a constant. I say this very carefully because no, I cannot compute the find such a constant. I'm not even close to that. So, but I can just state right now that all the cons, all these 20, more than 20 constants of the standard model, they're all rational numbers which in principle should be computable. But unfortunately, I haven't computed them because there is a very big hole. What's happening here? Um, oh, yes. Uh, oh, here comes, this is the final transparency practically. This is transparency saying that, that there's one thing that the standard model has and the model I've written down does not. And that is symmetries. There are many, many symmetries in the standard model that, um, that occur, such as translation symmetry. Now, translation symmetry on the left is relatively easy. You can look at the eigenvalues and then you can make continuous translations on the letters. That's relatively easy. But make continuous rotations on the letters is actually very hard in practice. Learn transformations are even more difficult because the learn group is a non compact group. So to make a theory learn invariant, you have to make infinitely many tests to see that the theory really is learns invariant. So that's very, very hard to comply with. So learns invariant is very difficult. Local gauge theories, the standard model is characterized by having a local gauge invariance in the definition of your fields. So I should introduce local gauge invariants in the procedure I've, I've done so now. I have not been able to do that. So this is where I fail to get the final theory. I don't know how to make this theory locally invariant. Well, I can replace the local gauge group by a discrete gauge group, a uh, permutation group, which has a discrete finite number of, of elements. Then you can do such a thing on the lattice. But the continuous gauge theories are again very difficult to make. The Brout and Gare Higgs mechanism on the lattice, well, that's also a symmetry procedure. And the holy grail really is a general coordinate transformations. I want the theory eventually also to comply with general relativity. It doesn't at this stage. And that is where I failed. I haven't been able to make the theory that powerful, but I think this is a good start that I've made. And this will be 
a, a, a good way to formulate the theory. Now the hard work still has to be done. And that is answer these questions about these symmetries that I had here before and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, find a systematic way to translate all the properties of the standard model, in, including all the mathematical difficulties, properties of these symmetry groups, how they interact mutually to get the states of the standard model. Very interesting question. The standard model gives you all the answers in terms of the standard model language to turn that into a quantum language. I told you how to do that in principle. In practice, that will be extremely hard, but I'm sure that there will be some smart young people coming up. I'm too old now to do this calculation in all detail, but maybe young people will be able to do this and figure out how to translate these words into practical calculations. And here I want to thank you. And my hope is that we can continue the discussion. I answered some questions while talking. You are now allowed to ask more questions until uh, um, until my final time is really over. Mm. Then I hope will tell us. Mm. Thank Bye. you very much, yeah, Professor. Thank you. Now, yeah, I have a question. question please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the kind talk. It was very, <laughs> very nice. I have two questions, actually. Yes. One is uh, related to uh, the fact you have connected everything to a classical theory and I, I was wondering about the sensitivity of this classical theory with respect to initial conditions, because at some point you claim that you may not care very much about the actual initial condition at the origin of the universe. But typically we know that some classical uh, models do have ex very high sensitivity with respect to initial conditions. I was wondering what is the role of that in this setup? Uh, a very, very yeah. important question. Um, well, we are used to thinking that if you have a stochastic theory, such as the weather, as a typical example, uh, yes. you see that the weather depends very, very much on initial conditions. The so-called butterfly effect you probably know about. The butterfly mm. effect is that if a, a butterfly somewhere in, in China flaps its wings a little bit differently from what it was supposed to do, it, it disobeys the laws of nature. You, you, there are no such butterflies, but suppose there was a butterfly that could violate the laws of nature by flapping its wings a little bit differently. That, that change in its, in its flapping of its wings will propagate. And there will be more and more air molecules that will react differently. After a while, the clouds would have a different shape. After a while, more and more things start to become different. In the very end, storms and weather patterns, if, in fact, in the end, also political decisions made, made by, by politicians all will become different because the butterfly has been flapping its wings a little bit different from what it was supposed to do. That's called the butterfly effect. And I, I take your question as being about that, that is there a butterfly effect in, in the real world? Very probably yes. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that will be the reason why the outcome of all our experiments are they controlled by quantum mechanics. Uh, so for instance, the LHC could have been out of luck and not have produced the Higgs mechanism by some pure quantum fluctuation. Maybe mm. political consequences will be different. People will no longer build big machines and then they have, they, they don't understand some things, they'll, they'll do different things. So there will be a butterfly effect from not detecting the Higgs in, in, into different uh, turning turnings of the world history. We don't know, but very likely, I think very likely the answer is yes, there will be a butterfly effect in the real world as well. Right. Thank you. I have another question related to the fact that you said that going into the Hilbert space description uh, provides you with a, like a much faster way of computing things. Yes. Uh, but my question is related to how is this connected to the computability of, of the universe? Let's say you start with a, a grid with uh, and the answer, uh, your ability to compute things by actually keeping track of all the degrees of freedom is is very limited. Uh, and my question is, if by doing to the quantum mechanical description, have you found a way of improving drastically the computability time of whatever we mean by solving problems in, in the universe? I'm thinking of polynomial versus non-polynomial time kind of things uh, of computability questions. Well, you know, to in, I think the standard model as you have it today gives you a very good answer to this that in practice, uh, we use Hilbert space to compute 
how electrons uh, evolve. For instance, we use Hilbert space to compute the, the uh, uh, magnetic moment of the electron. So uh, you probably know that, that QC, QED, quantum electrodynamics, is a component of the standard model that, that generates a very precise values for the elect magnetic dipole moment of the electron. So, but when people do use those computations, they stop after a certain number of terms. So mm -hmm. doing perturbation expansion up to n terms is practically easy. That's a polynomial amount of time you need for that, except the polynomial will rapidly increase if you want to go mm -hmm. to the next step. So after five or more steps or something, it becomes impossible to compute the, right. the magnetic moment of the electron because it's too difficult. So mm -hmm. it's not it's not non-polynomial as, as long as you say, I'm going to stop somewhere. Now, I see. a little bit worse, I, I, there's a little more I have to say about it. The situation is a little bit worse for the electron. We also know the perturbation expansion for the electron actually diverges, uh, but uh, be, things being as they are, it may well take 137 terms in the perturbation expansion before you really find that things diverge. And mm. same thing here, if L is 100, then after 100 steps, you have, 100 to the power 100, as the John said, that you still have something out, out that changes the world. So stop long before you went through 200 steps. But so in practice, we can say, well, we can, we can calculate certainly accurately enough to, to be happy with the answers. So the magnetic moment of the electron is, is known more precisely than anybody can measure practically. So, um, so we're happy with that. We don't need to go further. I think that will be the answer mm. in general, given to your answer to your question. Yes, it's it's not infinitely precisely calculated, but we don't need to go further because the errors we're making are smaller than can be detected in practice. So, uh, yeah. So your question is pro probably a little bit too mathematical to be of, of direct importance for physics. Right. Good questions about post question though. Take them all. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, if uh, this cellular automata they eventually uh, derives the the quantum mechanical or the Schrodinger equation, where do we get the um, the Copenhagen interpretation uh, in this from this deterministic process? Okay. Um, the what I did today in the talk, I tried to explain, but it's very hard within the hour to do so. That that. Um, the classical theory I write down are formally, from a mathematical point of view, they're equivalent to a quantum theory. That includes a standard model, but it also includes the fact that, this, that the perturbation expansion for the standard model diverges. So I, I will not be able to produce the, the reproduce the standard model with infinite accuracy, because before I reach the infinite accuracy, I reach the point that the, that the perturbation expansion does no longer converge. So, the inaccuracy is in the standard model itself, not in the theory here. The theory that I presented to you, in principle, has infinite accuracy. In practice, not, because in practice, to compute certain things will become harder than, than, than counting the number of, of, of atoms in the universe and things like this. So in practice, there are much more important limitations to tell you, no, I cannot reproduce the world as you know it with infinite precision. I cannot. And I never will be, but I can produce this the world that you know of in more precision than everybody can was able to compute these days in principle. In practice, again, no, because I don't have the right equations. But if I but I think I can write down roughly what the right equations will look like. And in principle, this should reproduce the, the real world more accurately than any perturbative expansion. Except that I will need more computer time than number of atoms in the universe to do that accurate calculation. So in practice, no, I'm sorry, I, can, I cannot do it. Because I cannot handle all the atoms in the universe. You know, that kind of practicality is what you, you run into. And of course, nobody can do a computation that complicated. So yes, I, there will be practical limitations. But no, there won't be any observable deviations from real quantum theory. I have a, yeah. I have a question. 
Uh, maybe my question uh, looks uh, very naive because I'm not an expert in this field, just a curious uh, person. But uh, as we know, uh, there is no a pure vacuum. Uh, there are uh, virtual particles which appear and disappear um, every second. From this point of view, how can we talk about determinicity uh, even for a single electron? If it is bombarded every second by uh, virtual particles? Well, I think you know what a van der Waals gas is. A van der Waals gas is a description of a gas in classical terms. It has, uh, uh, the equations are that the, the atoms be, are assumed to be billiard balls. Well, they aren't just billiard balls, like that, but suppose two billiard balls come together, they hit each other. And the way they bounce depends on the way they, they touch each other. And they can touch each other in infinitely many different ways. So if you follow a Van der gas closely, you can write down the equations for how the balls will hit each other. And you can assume a stochastic behavior. That is to say, when two balls approach each other, you never know exactly how they will approach each other. Maybe you know it with some very limited precision because you know where the balls came from. But you can, you can do that, that calculation in principle. There's no quantum mechanics there, but there's also no complete determinism in the sense that you have to introduce stochasticity because you don't know where these balls are exactly. It's too complicated. They form a random distribution in this world. But, um, but there's no quantum mechanics in the van der Waals gas. So that theory for that reason doesn't work so well. But, but it could have worked much better if people wrote down a much more powerful random noise model for the van der Waals gas. Maybe they can get an approximation of reality very much more precisely. But there's no reason to say I, I exclude the van der Waals gas because it doesn't predict things. No, it, it predicts things fine. It just isn't the right theory. So, so maybe on this way, we can construct an alternative theory which will be, uh, to a certain extent, equivalent to current quantum mechanics theory. Absolutely. That was, that's, right now, that's a conjecture. I cannot prove this, but I don't even know how to do it. So I cannot prove that, the, that one can make a, a, a classical theory that produces the standard, exactly the standard model. Because the standard model has features that I find very difficult to reproduce. That's only because I have my own mathematical limitations. But I think in principle, a very smart person could figure out all these things part by part. So you first have to understand how can a model be translation invariant? Then you have to understand how can a model be rotation invariant? And yet have finite amount of information like in a cell of automaton. I think that it's possible, but it's very hard to reproduce rotation invariance. Then Lorentz invariance and other symmetries are even harder to reproduce. So that's all the work you still have to do. But in principle, I think the, these questions have nothing to do with the fundamental question, is, which is whether stochastic behavior can come out. So I think that question can be answered uh, theoretically by saying, no matter what models you put in your, in your cell or automaton, you'll get behavior that will generate effectively random, random walks so that uh, random behavior, so that uh, we are in a good position to start from here. But we still have to do all the hard work to get it done precisely. Okay, thank you. More questions? Uh, uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, I still get, uh, can't get uh, how your theory uh, can overcome Bell's inequality. Do you mean uh, Alice and Bob cannot choose the Ethics of experimental device uh, by free will. They can't choose uh, device, ethics of device uh, randomly. Well, I explained that you have to ask this question at the level of the classical underlying theory. So, how can the classical underlying theory violate Bell's inequalities? Well, the classical underlying theory does reproduce exactly the events that Bob and Alice are measuring. But there's one thing that the classical theory cannot do, which is it cannot force Bob and Alice 
they do what we call a counterfactual measurement. So if they do a measurement, they have their, their devices in certain uh, angles and they see a photon going through this filter, not going through that filter. So then they make a note of the measurements, but the outcome of the measurements is yes, the photon went through, or no, the photon did not go through. So it's a bit of a So photon can, can either go through or cannot go through. They cannot put their devices such that the photons will be superpositions when they go through the, the state. That is impossible. And that is incorrectly assumed in these uh, uh, arguments about Bell's inequality that you can put the device into a state where the photon will come up out of certain probabilities. No, photons will only come, either come out or not come out, and all circumstances, which means that the real universe is always in an ontological state. It's a so called ontology, ontology conservation law. The universe starts off in a state that, yes, the balls are here and not there. It will always be in a state where all these balls, billions of them, are all in, in definite positions and they are not in other positions. I cannot put them in any other position. So the decision made by Bob and Alice to make a certain uh, configuration of their settings was a decision made in their minds eventually. And in, in their minds, they could make a choice, but they could not, not make a superposition of choices. How can you, how can I, I can ask you, can you make a, a choice that your, your actions or your questions are a superposition of two different questions? No, you cannot. You can only ask this question or that question. You cannot make a, a superposition. So that error was being made by Bell. And uh, from his point of view, it is difficult to see why, the, why you could, should not make that assumption. But my claim is yes, you can, uh, you, you can say that that is forbidden. Bell was not allowed to ask Bob or Alice to make a superposition of the settings of their measuring device. Impossible. They cannot. Okay. And the reason why they cannot is because in their past, it couldn't, the, the, the switch could not be made. And Bell said, well, what, 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 who cares what was done in the past? And then it, Bell's, uh, Bob and Alice made decisions independent of the past. No, they did not. Their decision has. Uh, is linked to what happened in the past, whether you like it or not. So that is the lack of fundamental free will that Bob and Alice have. Thank you very much for your nice talk. More questions? I have uh, so hi. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so, I'm trying to wrap my head around this because this picture with the orbits and everything, it looks suspiciously like an, you take an action angle formulation of classical mechanics and you go through with the old quantum theory, quantizing the angle variable of your action angle described canonical variables. No, um, I'm not. Why not? That. Um, first of all, the cellular automaton does not have to obey Newton's laws. It is just an arbitrary, completely arbitrary evolution law. You can, this matrix U can be any matrix containing ones and zeros. As long as it is time reversible, it doesn't have to obey any other restriction. So uh, even if you introduce a Newtonian energy, uh, you, you cannot, um, uh, it's, it's not the energy that I use for, uh, but the quantum calculations, that's the quantum energy. The quantum energy is not the same thing as Newtonian energy. In, in the real world, of course, you, you use both, both concepts of energy in the same way, but the energy of a planet is, is of course much, much bigger than the energy of a certain particle. But, um, uh, but the Newtonian principles of action and, and Newtonian principles of action and reaction do not necessarily apply in, in this theory. So and, that's not that's not the stage I go through. I'm not going to quantize a the classical theory. No, the classical theory stays completely classical. It's I'm doing not doing a mathematical any mathematical um, procedure with the classical theory. So when you say quantize it, you replace uh, annual momenta by by discrete annual momenta and so on. That is, that is modifying the model. They're not modifying it. I'm just 
The Scavi model in terms of a matrix which contains ones and zeros only. Uh, well, it lo looks to me when I look at the eighth, uh, uh, I don't know, eighth, uh, whatever the picture was, that you have the Hamilton Jacobi equations in which only a single variable uh, evolves. And now you just, uh, for some reason, quantize this. Uh, variable phi I'm, or I'm the position on the ring. No, oh, no. I mean, you're I'm introducing some division anything. of this ring. <laughs> Necessarily. Sorry, come, go, uh, I don't quite follow what you, did you repeat that? Okay, so we start with the Hamilton Jacobi equation and you have no. one Hamilton Jacobi no, no, equation no. that is non trivial. And this is the constant of motion. This is the omega frequency that you get for this ring. And there is multiple rings you introduce for different variables, and they again collapse into some classical KIM tori. Um, I'm not uh, using Hamilton Jacobi principle to quantize something. That's that's not the quantization I'm doing. I'm just using quantum notation only. So the mathematics of the of the collisions or whatever happens is not changed. So a cell automaton doesn't have to be described as things moving in some way, but um, but uh, uh, you just say that there's an evolution law. One single state evolves to another single state. And the prescription is for all possible states the system can be in, there is an evolution law. And um, that evolution law tells you without any, uncertainty what happens next. Then I describe the evolution law as if it was a matrix at nothing, but that's not doing so-called quantization. I'm just um, introducing a matrix containing ones and zeros only. The one is the thing it evolves into, and the zeros are the things it does not evolve into. That's not the same thing as quantizing in, in the classical, in the standard sense that people decide how many years ago. If you are planets moving in or in elliptical orbit, you can quantize the theory and then you get the hydrogen atom basically around. But the hydrogen atom has very different evolution laws. So I'm not doing that particular step. Okay, any further questions? Okay, then, okay, then I mean, yeah, finally, and let, let's I mean, thanks again, Professor Gerald, too, for his, I mean, very enthusiastic colloquium and, very, I mean, very kind and question and answer time. Yeah. So yeah. now, if you do not have further questions, let's close this colloquium. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I, may I thank, thank you. you for your kind hospitality and for organizing this uh, get together to uh, allow me the opportunity to. to Give my talk. Thank you. Very no, it's my great pleasure. I mean, please, please, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. See you later. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah.